How does something unaware that it is alive become aware of the fact that it is alive? Arguably a question that's never been more important than it is today. Intuitively, we all know what consciousness is. It's what you're feeling right now, being aware both of yourself and your surroundings. But if we actually try to boil it down, pinpoint exactly what it is, nobody really knows, which is disturbing to think about. If I were to throw a rock across a pond, there are physical forces of reality the rock would be subject to. But it doesn't feel anything. It doesn't experience joy or pain or suffering. It doesn't reminisce on the beauty of the blue sky or the pleasure of the air it moves through. It just is. Now imagine a dog chasing a ball. There will be, again, facts of the physical process it is subject to. But this time, there will also be something the dog feels. What that is doesn't really matter. The point is it will feel something. To be conscious in its most primitive sense is that it is the difference between a rock and a dog, a feeling from its point of view that shapes its reality. It is the kind of thing that has experiences, both good and bad, the kind of thing that can smell, laugh, cry, and fundamentally experience. Somewhere in evolutionary history, there is a line drawn between these two entities, something that has no experiences of any kind and something that has lots of them. But finding that line is extremely difficult. I mean, how can we possibly pinpoint the origin of consciousness if we don't even understand its nature? You'd probably be surprised to learn, the way I was, that there's a whole field of dedicated researchers purely focused on trying to solve this problem. And in the last 10 years, they've made a crazy amount of progress. As an example, neural correlates of consciousness have been identified. And consciousness, at least in us, seems to stem from different areas, mainly the thalamus and cortex working together, as opposed to coming from a single region. Regardless, with the progress these fields have made, I think we're ready to tackle the question of how consciousness evolved in a serious way. To start, there's one important theoretical framework we need to grasp, descent with modification. All organisms alive today are descended from a single ancestor that lived long ago, LUCA, which stands for the last universal common ancestor. Before humans, before dinosaurs, and before consciousness, this was the organism that through the iterative process of selection would eventually lead to us. That's the hypothesis anyway. But Luca wasn't conscious, at least in the way we would define it today. But that doesn't mean it wasn't alive. A living being or the self is something that requires an intake of energy and uses that to try and make more of itself, which is the first step in developing an inner feeling or consciousness, being aware. For a trait to evolve, regardless of how complex it's become, it had to provide some type of benefit. Consciousness, at least initially, probably evolved to direct small multicellular organisms towards an energy source. But the organism in this context doesn't have to be conscious to find this energy source. It just has to be aware. A great example of this is the run and tumble behavior of certain bacteria. E. coli uses something called a flagella to move through its environment. When encountering areas with food, they do something called tumbling, where they slowly and randomly change direction. They do this to explore this area and try and obtain as much food as possible. In contrast, when food is scarce, these bacteria switch into a run phase, where they move in a linear direction for as long as possible until they find a new food source. This is an example of awareness, although it is limited. It never aims its direction and doesn't move with a target in mind. It's just autonomous. And as a result, doesn't have to be conscious to carry out its task. But it is important because one of the major steps towards the evolution of consciousness was probably when this action shifted from random unguided movement to directed movement with a purpose. This requires not only a basic nervous system, but for actions to be guided by decisions. I can't think of a better model for this type of organism than C. elegans. This roundworm, which has a nervous system made up of only 302 neurons, is probably the most studied organism in neuroscience. But despite its incredibly basic nervous system, it can exhibit extremely complex behavior. C. algans uses chemotaxis through a combination of sensory and motor neurons to direct its movement. Using chemical gradients, its sensory neurons will detect changes in concentrations it will then use to either move towards food when hungry or away from harmful chemicals when in danger, using its environment to guide its action. This is probably what accounted for the first step that would inevitably end up in becoming the senses. And while using gradients is a good way of directing movement, I don't think most people believe C. elegans is conscious. And that's primarily because this behavior, while decision-based, is still reflexive. It doesn't feel anything. 
Organisms that blindly follow a gradient or react to their environment still don't have any understanding of where they're going. They just go. So the next step then would be a sense that helps us understand the space we exist in. This is what vision is. It adds a whole new dimension to awareness and allows an organism to not only be aware of where it's going, but also where the danger lies, where its food is, and the best route of getting there. It's a way of perceiving and collecting more information about the world around them. But there's another factor here as well. Vision requires a complex nervous system to function, and that's partly because of visual spacing, learning, and memory. In its early stages, vision probably evolved from simple light-sensitive cells, called photoreceptors, which provided organisms with enough information about their surroundings, but had some drawbacks. Vision can only work as long as we see something. And so quickly, the light-sensitive cells had to evolve through refinements in structure, not only to be more accurate, but also to account for memory. A visual representation of the food source had to be mapped out in our mind, so that we knew what to pursue even if the food source we were chasing wasn't present. This is called intentionality. And this is just my opinion, but I think this is the line where consciousness starts to emerge. And that's because memory and learning go hand in hand. The minimal point of consciousness is one that requires a basic ability to map together different sensory information from multiple sources into one coherent perception. It requires the ability to filter out unnecessary things and focus on relevant ones instead. But above all else, it requires the ability to learn. Ginsberg and Jablonka proposed a theory for the evolutionary origin of consciousness in the form of something called unlimited associative learning. It refers to the ability for the self to continuously learn from its experience, without big constraints, which then contribute to the being refining its consciousness through its newly learned behavior. Learning, by definition, is a change in behavior based on experience. It requires senses that can lead to changes in the internal state of the being, memory for this internal change to be stored, and some type of reinforcement so that later exposures can manifest in behavioral changes. Consciousness is most likely a gradient, and while I do believe this to be the starting point for it, it doesn't mean organisms that fit this criteria have the same level of consciousness or awareness as us. But you can see how something like this can quickly scale out. If memory and learning allow the self to store pictures in its mind of what to pursue, it soon would also be able to predict or anticipate the action of its prey. And this, through enough iterations, can develop into an understanding of time, maybe not in the abstract sense, but at least through a decision-making lens, such as timing in a hunt. This integration through time means the self would be able to hold and process information even when nothing is happening in its environment, which in other words, means it would be able to think. Eventually, this could translate into risk assessment, communication, and teamwork, but that would require something called a sense of self, or at least a basic version of it. This would mean the being could recognize itself as distinct from others, something that requires agency, an understanding of not only one's own body in relation to its environment, but also the sense of playing an active role in one's own outcomes and experiences. I'm unsure about whether a basic understanding of timing or agency came first. Just like memory and learning, it seems like these two processes go hand in hand. But what I do know is that theory of mind would probably be the final piece in this puzzle. Theory of mind is the ability to attribute mental states such as beliefs or intentions to others and to understand how these perspectives differ from our own. In the context of consciousness and our previous definition of being aware both of yourself and others, I don't see any other state that would lead to more awareness than this. It's agency but applied to others. Understanding the self, but understanding others also have a self. Only the most intelligent of animals have been able to demonstrate theory of mind. For example, young chimpanzees have consistently demonstrated their willingness to help researchers in the retrieval of dropped items without even being asked for help, suggesting that these chimpanzees were able to understand the researchers' intentions and jump in to help them. Rhesus monkeys have also been known to only steal when they know they can get away with it and are less inclined to do so when others, this can be either other rhesus monkeys or humans, are watching, which means they understand their actions and how it affects others. Theory of mind is a necessary step towards complex consciousness. It can aid in solving higher order problems, such as using strategies to find and encircle prey, or allow for social species to emerge, who through cooperation can then reign supreme even if they are not the biggest or the strongest. But at the beginning of this video, the difference in feeling between a rock and a dog is what I use to define consciousness. Kind of bizarre, I know. 
And throughout the evolution of traits that would lead to the varying levels of consciousness, I never outlined where or how emotion falls into this. And that's because the relationship between emotion and consciousness is not really understood. While emotion is like the color that adds varying shades to our experience, I don't think it is required for the self to emerge. When I say a dog chasing a ball will feel something, I don't just mean with regards to its emotion. I mean in regards to the self. It will feel the wind. It will feel the sun. And it will feel the world around it as it runs after the ball using its senses to take in information. It is the emergence of agency, learning, and intentionality that allows the self to exist. All because at one point in time, microscopic organisms gain survival benefits at each step along the way. And this is the idea behind Descent with Modification. Still, if you're like me, you're probably feeling like there's so much more left to consciousness that I haven't explored. And that's because there is. For example, how does this apply to AI? AI is something not subject to the same selection process we have been, so how will consciousness manifest itself in artificially created intelligence? And what about the collective unconscious? Prominent psychoanalysts have long argued that this is just as important to our being as anything else. And of course the list just goes on. What about the feeling we get from music or imagination or stories? All of these are relevant as well. But in my opinion, probably the most important question is, what about purpose? How did the self become so complex that it needs meaning to feel adequate? These are all topics that are related, in my opinion, to consciousness. And so if we're going to explore the state of being, we might as well do it right. And in this series, that is what I intend to do. Until next time. Cheers.